All right, why don't we get started? I think we have a pretty good group here um, and others hopefully can trickle in. Uh, all right, welcome everyone. We're so excited to have everyone here with us for Washingtonians for Public Banking's first public event since we formed. My name is Naisheen. I'm one of the board members of WPB and I live in Seattle. Um, I left my tech job over a year ago to dedicate my time to advocating for progressive policy and I started my journey focused on progressive revenue and housing. And then when I was introduced to public banking, it really complemented those other interests really well. I'd love to see our tax revenues stay invested in state on critical issues like housing that I care so much about. And so I was really excited to join the board and help the organization get started and learn more about public banking. Um, we're still very new. Uh, we've been run so far by an all volunteer board up to this point. So our capacity has been limited, but we're looking to hire a staff member soon who can dedicate a lot more time and kickstart or start our activities. Um, so even those very early days for us, we wanted to have this public event because we know a critical part of building this movement is all of you. Each of our current board members brings different expertise and passions, but we have so much to learn from the community and know there's a lot of great leaders and resources out there who we haven't connected with yet. Um, we also know that public banking is still unfamiliar to a lot of folks and we're happy today to go over some background information and hopefully activate some new advocates for this cause. All right, um, so why don't we go to the next slide and we can talk a little bit about our agenda. Okay, so um, we're going to start out just with a little bit of background on our organization, how we formed. Um, we'll all be turning it over to a colleague to go do a public banking 101 and give some background information. Then we have a great guest speaker, Olivia Hickerson from Sidewalk, an organization in Thurston County. Um, and then we will talk about kind of what's next and where we're going from here and what you can do to stay involved. And then we'll wrap with the Q&A. All right, let's go to the next slide. All right, so uh, Washingtonians for Public Banking, WPB for short. Um, as you can see here, our mission is to establish a public bank in Washington that serves the public good and complement the private sector that serves private profits. A little bit of background. Um, so public bank, the public banking movement in Washington um, kind of kickstarted organically in 2008 when the subprime mortgage scandal was happening. Um, and our group was preceded by over a decade of work by ad hoc citizen groups and legislators work, um, including Bob Hasegawa um, and Seattle initiatives for advocating for public banking. Um, our group spun out directly from um, the League of Women Voters Committee on Public Banking. So we have a couple members who were a part of that task force who broke out um, and dedicated this organization to public banking. Uh, we filed for our 501c3 status last spring and finally got that approval at the end of last year. So that was very exciting. Um, next slide. So to talk a little bit about um, what we've done so far. So we've, like I said, we've been around um, uh, not very long, about six months of, of work by all volunteer board. So we've been limited, but we've recruited nine members to our board of directors. I had that list and I had a slide with the list of our board here, but it seems to have disappeared. <laughs> oh, I found it. I'm gonna pull it up. Um, Marco, can you go to the slide before? Uh, I'm not sure if it's showing our board member list, but um, we can show that later. All right, so we have um, met with our some elected officials uh, in the past few months as the legislative session was kicking off, including Senator Patty Cooter and- I believe it ended up at the, give me one moment. I, we can return the slide. Okay. 
I think I just fixed it. I'll just keep talking when you do that. <laughs> we met with um, the state treasurer and others to just introduce our group, um, get to know them, um, let them know our support for public banking, and um, we're looking forward to, to developing those relations those relationships further. Um, we also just had to do the general setup of our organization, set up our technology platforms to manage our supporters and communications, donations, um, our social media. We did some fundraising and we raised enough to support a part-time staffer for a little while and we're working on that hiring plan right now. Um, and then we also developed a 2023 strategic plan and quarterly goals uh, for ourselves. And one of our most important 2023 goals is to connect with the community and learn from those who would benefit from public banking and other experts um, and build that larger coalition of people with power. So that is what we are kicking off today. Um, for the legislative session, we sent an email blast to you know hundreds of supporters to to support the public banking bill SB 5509. Um, in case you were wondering just where that's at, it appears that it's not moving forward in the session. It was in committee, um, but it did not get the number of votes or signatures to pass. It was five, they had four out of the nine committee members um, vote for it. And unfortunately there was one uh, Democrat that, that did not support it. Um, so, it looks like it won't be moving forward, but we know this is uh, if these efforts can take a long term. We're in it for the long haul. Um, we're looking forward to developing this movement further so that we can be more successful next time. All right, um, so that is a little bit of background. Oh, I see a question on which Democrat it was, wasn't did support it. It was um, Mullet, I believe from District, uh, Congressional District 5. Yeah, Representative Mark Mullen. Um, and then the other four who did not support were Republicans. So uh, work to do still. Okay, so that's um, a background just on our organization and what we've been up to so far. I'm going to turn it over to another board member, Marco, Marco Rosero Bassi, to talk a little bit more about public banking. For it, Marco. Uh, thank you, Nasheen. And uh, I'd like to just thank everyone for attending. Um, I'm really excited about this cause and I'm excited about the um, uh, the interest that people have shown into public banking. Uh, this presentation, we're gonna talk about the grand ideas about public banking, and we're gonna talk about uh, what has happened on a national level, then we're gonna take more on a local level. I also saw a note that my microphone is muted. Can anybody hear me? I don't have it muted. You're fine. We can hear you. We can hear me, okay. So, sorry if you're having trouble seeing me, check your speakers, okay? Um, but we're gonna start this presentation with this quote, uh, about public banking. And it says, we are not used to th thinking of banking as a public sector function, but few things could be more critical to the well being of the public than the management of public funds. This quote, which was from the uh, someone who was a representative from the League of Women Voters, really encompasses the idea of public banking and the ethos of this organization. And it's apropos that it is chosen by the League of Women Voters because they are an organization that has really uh, kept this cause alive here in Washington State before this organization formed. Many of the, our board members did their previous work with the League of Voters, League of Women Voters. Uh, so they are an organization that we look to for a lot of inspiration inspiration in moving this project forward. And the quote really speaks to the mission of the organization is that we want to bring banking into the public realm so we can serve public needs. So let's talk about what it means to have a public bank. How is it different from a private bank? Well, it's different in several respects. One, it's owned by a public institution. So that can include a city, a state, a region, a territory, uh, a tribe, or a conglomerate, a confederation of all those things. But it's owned by some type of public institution. All right. The other thing that's unique is that it can hold deposits such as taxes and fees from that are from the government. So public funds, the government, it can hold that as deposits to finance the bank. 
Also, because it's a public institution, um, and especially in a democratic setting, it has oversight and transparency. And a private institution that's considered private information, you don't necessarily have public oversight over it. In a public bank, that's not the case, all right? Also, because it's a public inf uh, institution, it's not necessarily guided by the uh, profit maximization. It is there to serve the benefit of the public, all right? Um, and in that, it is supposed to embody the values and needs of its community. And it is designed to invest in the community, all right, rather than guaranteeing profits for the people who own the bank, all right? This is sets up a different relationship because the bank is not beholden to private shareholders or a personal owner. Uh, instead, it's beholden to the public. So the public gets to determine determine how the bank operates, what are its priorities, and what is our, its investment strategies. Now, a good thing about, uh, good things that public banks can do is that they can provide consistent, affordable credit to meet crises and green light current needs and fund future, fund the future. Private banks operate through market mechanisms, and with the market mechanisms, they only can invest in things in which they can guarantee they're going to get the really robust returns. Again, because their purpose is to maximize profits for their owners. This is not the case with a private bank. With a private bank, it can actually serve social, pub, sorry, with a public bank. With a public bank, it can actually serve social needs, and it doesn't have to worry about profit maximization. And because of this, it can invest in areas that may benefit the community at large, um, even though they are not the most profitable. And it could undergo practices that can really help people. Uh, such thing is that it can provide low cost loans, so you can have low interest rates. It can lend when the economy is bad. A lot when the economy is bad, a lot of private banks contract because they think investment is really risky. Well, public bank can lend during those times to help jumpstart the economy. It can also provide stabilization in the business cycle and for budgets. Uh, it can rapidly respond to disasters when you um, need might need a line of credit really way to fund um, uh, projects to deal with that disaster. It can partner with local institutions such as small businesses and high and uh, other small institutions that may not necessarily um, have the most uh, robust returns. It can also prioritize environmental concerns. So with that, it can um, invest in clean energy, uh, uh, eco sustainability, all those projects that don't have necessarily the greatest returns, but they benefit society in general. And then it can also guarantee that there is independence from the uh, mechanisms on Wall Street and that we can guarantee that the money in a local community stays in that community and it's reinvested in that community. So the movement for public banking is a national movement here in the United States. Uh, as you can see from the map, there are several active campaigns. Um, and, but there is only one state that has actually established a public bank on a statewide level. And that is the state of North Dakota. That was established during the progressive era from uh, really for Birchall from an organization called the Nonpartisan League, which managed to use the primary system to its maximum effect and get its progressive candidates elected in both the Democrat and the Republican party and form a majority within the um, uh, when the and the state legislature and when they did that, they were able to uh, uh, pra pass this as one of the progressive projects, which means that North Dakota is has uh, a lot of resiliency in their economy because of it. And this public institution, this public bank, is able to, to uh, make funds out to homeowners for mortgages. It's helped students pay with their student loans. It's helped small businesses and farmers, and really provides a. a uh, tr uh, tremendous safety net and grid foundation for the entire state's economy. Mo so much so that they were able to weather the 2008 financial crash in a much better way than the rest of the other states and states were. So I talked about, we're going to talk about big picture federal legislation because there is legislation to establish a national bank. Throughout United States history, there has been series we have established as national bank. Uh, unfortunately, we've sort of done away with them. And in a modern sense, we deal with the uh, um, uh, uh, Federal Reserve System, which is a kind of a quasi-private and public 
public institution at the same time, but really doesn't do a lot of things that the public a public bank does. But there is legislation on a national level to create a infrastructure bank. All right, uh, this is House Bill three 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 nine. Now, the infrastructure bank would lend up to five trillion dollars in infrastructure projects throughout the United States. All right, these projects include um, uh, sixteen high critical areas identified by the American Society of Civil Engineers and, and would invest in housing, high-speed rail, water projects. Uh, the, it's estimated that these, if this bank was established and these infrastructure projects could be funded, it would create 25 million new jobs and increase GDP on country by 5% per year. Right? And because the bank is a nonprofit institution that's supposed to serve the public good, excess from the profit go to a trust fund uh, to provide grants for poor communities. So now let's talk about what do we mean to bring public banking here to Washington and talk about critical areas we think that the bank could fund to make our state better for everybody. As an organization, we want to talk sort of about three areas where uh, we think that a public bank could really benefit the state. And they include transit infrastructure, green energy, and housing. And we are fortunate that our speaker today will talk more about the critical situation that we face with housing in our state and how a, bump, uh, a, a public bank can benefit that cause. So first off, with infrastructure uh, and public transit, it's important to recognize that Washington State actually scores fairly low uh, on terms of uh, uh, a good state for streets and roads. Recently, we ranked 49th of 50 streets for drivers, all right? Um, partially, this is because of our lack of investments in streets, roads, public infrastructure, and walkable areas, which creates, unfortunately, a lot of traffic and a lot of traffic uh, on roads that are in poor conditions, all right? Now, the American Society of Civil Engineers has kind of warned Washington that because we've seen tremendous population growth, we're not keeping the pace with investment in our roads and transit infrastructure, all right? And if at the current rate of investment, if we can can you see this growth without this um, changes in our funding mechanisms, our road conditions are going to and our, and our transit infrastructure is going to be dramatically worsened over the years. Another crisis that we're facing is uh, our, our clean energy crisis. All right, so Washington has tried to be a real leader in terms of clean energy. And we, in 2019, we passed this legislation that said we're gonna get off fossil fuels. We're gonna end our reliance on uh, coal by 2025. So in the next uh, two years, and we're gonna try to be carbon neutral in the next 2030. So a really ambitious goal to get off fossil fuels. The problem is that we have not funded the clean energy transformation to make this goal possible, all right? Um, we approximately 20% of Washington's energy still generate through fossil fuels. We have some coal on the grid, we, we have some gas. Fortunately, a lot of our energy still comes from hydro, but nevertheless, we have it there and we haven't found a lot of investment, a lot of replacement. So that means that unless we start making some major investments in clean energy in the state, we're either not going to meet these goals or we're going to start face blackouts. Uh, and uh, that's blackouts, uh, if everyone saw from what happened in Texas last year, really uh, injure the poorest and cripple a state's economy, all right? So we need a public bank uh, and public institutions to start making those investments so we can catch up to meet these goals. And the final area we wanna talk about is housing, all right? We are in care, uh, experiencing a major housing crisis uh, in the state, 40% uh, uh, Washington's renters are rent burden, means that they pay them more than one third of their income for housing. Washington has the third highest mortgage debt in the country. And the way a public bank could deal with this is they can fund new affordable housing and innovative new models of housing, such as co-ops. They can get that capital so that we can have a more plentiful housing supply, more plentiful options, increase the supply of housing to hopefully bring down the cost and make housing more for, make housing more available to everyone. Now, a question comes about why do we need a bank? Why can't we just fund these things through normal debt? Well, a major problem is, is that we're seeing increasingly debt, as this graph shows, in Washington state. We've seen a debt increase, increase, increase. And we don't have a lot of mechanisms for ensuring that we keep up with this debt because we don't have an income tax in the state and we have a very regressive tax system.
Now, according to a report from the Washington State Treasury, this was in 2019, Washington has the sixth highest debt per capita for any state in the country. In the next five years, government debt is to climb to 70 billion to over 90 billion, all right? Uh, without an income tax, with a progressive tax system, we're really limited on how we can um, deal with this increasing debt without raising some more regressive sales and property taxes. One way we could do with this, though, is we want to call attention is we could try to finance things through a public bank. And as long as the bank is solvent um, and responsible with its funds, we can make these critical investments without contributing more to, to our, our um, state and municipal debt. So now I want to hand it over off to Olivia, who, uh, who can talk more about um, how this project of public banking could benefit the organization that she works for, uh, which is uh, Sidewalk. Hello. <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you for having me today. Um, am I able to share my screen? <clears throat> is that OK? Yes, let us make you co-host. All right, you should be able to know. Can everybody see that? Yep. Okay. Awesome. Um, so this is how um, public banking and affordable housing can work together. First, I'll kind of start off with a little bit about me. <clears throat> My name is Olivia Hickerson. Um, I am the executive director of Sidewalk. We operate in Thurston County. We have three programs, diversion, um, community court, and then our foundational community supports. So we can give financial assistance. And then we also have um, our certified peer counselors through our FCS program that um, meet with participants to just help them obtain and maintain housing. So we kind of facilitate the financial piece, but then we also have the supportive um, aspect as well. And then we also um, facilitate the, we don't facilitate the community court, but we um, partner with community court to help people who are unhoused through that um, navigate the social system as well. My experience lies in operating emergency shelters, transitional and permanent housing. And so I didn't put anything in the chat because it's kind of my whole presentation, but I'm passionate about affordable housing. Um, so there's that <laughs> and making it available to everyone. So what is affordable housing? So the definition of affordable housing is residential housing that is rented by a person or a household whose monthly housing costs, including utilities other than telephone, do not exceed 30% of the household monthly income. So affordable housing is dependent upon what your income level is. Therefore, that tells us there is not going to be one solution to this. Um, we're going to need a variety of styles of housing um, from ADUs to tiny homes to renovating existing infrastructure and then building dense housing. So why is affordable housing important? So um, <clears throat> right now, affordable housing costs the American economy about $2 trillion a year in lower wages and productivity. Families have less opportunities to increase their earnings. Every dollar invested in affordable housing boosts local economies by leveraging the public and private resources <clears throat> and then supporting job creation and retention. The most significant piece of this um, is that it gives individuals the security they need to address other goals and milestones that they uh, may have. And we see this in the housing first approach, um, giving someone a house so that they can address 
other barriers instead of assuming that they need to address barriers before they can have housing. So um, some examples of this is with Rockford, Illinois. Um, they eliminated chronic and veteran homelessness through a multi-agency approach and initiated community solutions built for zero program. And if I have my statistics right, I think Washington state only has four counties that are participating in built for zero. So that's another step, um, you know, based on resources, that's not going to be available for every um, community or county in Washington state. But getting that built for zero program implemented um, is going to be very beneficial. We have implemented it in Thurston County, and I'm actually a part of one of the core teams of that. Um, so that's kind of the next step of getting the built for zero initiative because it's working. So they've done this by um, utilizing existing housing options um, in their county or in their city. So Lancaster City and County in Pennsylvania, they ended chronic homelessness through the Built for Zero as well. One of their focuses was building relationships with landlords, which I have found is very crucial um, being in an organization that provides financial assistance. So we're paying landlords, um, usually not market rate. It's more so like if they have a family member staying somewhere. We ask permission from their landlord. They say, yes, they can stay. And then we provide um, just a stipend to kind of offset those uh, grocery and electric costs um, with having an extra person. So it is important to build those relationships with landlords um, so that they, there's a lot of stigmas and stuff that go around. And so having people that are working closely with people who are unhoused advocating for them and building those relationships with landlords is going to be crucial. So this community's average rent is $834, <clears throat> which you would need 107, you would need to work 107 hours a week at the rate of $7.25 an hour just to pay rent. And Washington State's is way more than $834. So that's excessive for anyone. And about 72 households um, are cost burden, um, that's national, and they're just one traumatic um, event away from being homeless. So the current path that we are on does not leave room for costly events to happen in our lives. So here's some facts about affordable housing. Um, I, when I was creating this, everyone usually does myths about affordable housing, but I thought let's just approach it from facts. Let's get the negativity just out of our minds altogether. So here's some facts about affordable housing. Um, it's crucial in the conversation that we have. And so affordable housing buildings do not drive down um, property values. Um, they don't attract undesirable residents. Affordable housing, it helps grow communities and promote development and investment into your local um, communities. And most residents that um, move into affordable housing units, they reside in the city that they became homeless in. And I know that's a big, um, controversial thing of if we build this, will it attract homeless people? It's a myth. People who are homeless grew up, majority grew up where they started homelessness. So um, that is definitely a myth. And then with their extra um, disposable income, affordable housing residents will um, have more opportunity to purchase from local shops and businesses, thus promoting um, growth and supporting local business owners. So here is where public banking has an opportunity to really make a difference um, in Washington by addressing the systemic issue of home ownership. 
So 31% of black households own their homes compared to 68% of white households. Um, another contributing factor to this is redlining. We see that still today. Um, it is still active. Redlining is refusal to issue a loan or insurance because someone lives in an area deemed to be a poor financial risk. This affects many people of color and um, disproportionately so. In Washington state, <clears throat> roughly 25,000 people are estimated to be unhoused. Um, and we know in this industry that that is way more. Um, there is a lot of people that get missed in that, um, the pit count, which is usually how that comes out. So some other contributing factors um, to homelessness, and it's kind of, it goes back to um, addressing those stigmas, lack of affordable housing, healthcare, inadequate wages, poverty, food insufficiency. It's not laziness, it's not go and get a job. There are a lot of things that contribute to being homeless and those stig stigmatized ideas are not accurate. Um, so I think leading that and approaching that with people who have reservations about building affordable housing is gonna be important. You're gonna have to um, make sure the messaging around that mitigates the fear that people have because fear is just based in um, not knowing about a situation. So it's gonna take a multi-agency approach to uh, meet all of these factors. Public banking obviously can be that financial side by reinvesting um, in the community. The local community are the experts about what the needs are. And so having public banking is going to be crucial in that because if the funds are coming back into the community, the community is making that decision because they live here and they know what is needed. And so I think that is going to be um, a great partnership um, when this gets up and running. And so lastly, we need to invest in affordable housing because everybody deserves a place to call home and ultimately it is the right thing to do. So thank you for having me. Um, if you have any questions, I am happy to answer any and my contact information is right here if any of you would like to connect after this. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Olivia. It was great to learn more about the great, the wonderful work your organization is doing. All right, um, we did, we had, um, you might've seen another a speaker's name on the slide, um, but we actually, that one fell through. And so um, we will move on with our agenda. Uh, uh, let's get our slides back up. So um, we want to just talk a little bit more about um, just just provide a few extra points about the public bank legislation history in Washington. Um, as we mentioned before, Senator Bob Hasegawa was very involved and had uh, public banking bills introduced through from 2010 to 2018. In 2021, Senator Patty Cooter. Um, who represents Bellevue and the areas around there took over sponsoring that bill, introducing SB 5188. That bill did pass to the Senate, but died in the House. And as we have already mentioned earlier, the bill this year has not made it out of committee. So where does that leave us? Let's talk about some things that we can do from here. If you go to the next slide. So it's still really important to be communicating with our legislators that 
we want a public bank and we're invested, you know, in this beyond the, the bill that is there. Um, and, and we're looking for, you know, public banking in Washington and we're not going to let up on that. So I'm going to put a link in the chat that will take you to a comment page on this bill. Um, you don't have to know too much about the bill, but if you want to drop a quick comment that will, it will filter to the legislators that represent your district once you enter your address. And you could just send them a note to say, you know, we're we're still pushing for for public banking beyond this le this legislative session. And our team will be working hard to uh, build those connections with our legislators over the next year, and um, and kind of taking all angles to support this bill next time. We we started very late this year because we had just formed, and so we um, were just getting started as the legislative session was beginning. Um, as a part of that, so uh, building our movement is the next, is is the really important thing now. So we would love to connect with people, um, with organizations that are aligned. Um, I put our direct email in there and we'll put it in the chat as well. Um, we are happy to, if you are part of a group, um, an organization and you would like to have, have us present or have somebody present to you um, and your, your, your group more about public banking. We are more than happy to arrange that. We also have our newsletter, which some of you may be on already. Um, I'm gonna put a link for where you can sign up for that. We don't spam you. We at most when it's busy, we've sent maybe one email a week. So um, we'll keep you up to date with events happening, action items you can take, and just what's going on with public banking. Um, we also have some social media. So we have a Twitter and Facebook account. I will put those in the chat as well. If you're on any of those platforms, please do follow us there. We will also be putting updates um, as you know, real-time updates as they're happening. And then lastly, um, if you are willing and able, we would love a donation of any size to the Washingtonians for Public Banking organization. I'll put that in the chat as the last link. Um, we have a lot of work we want to do. Um, as mentioned, we are working on hiring a staff member soon who can then accelerate our work a great deal. Um, by raising donations that will pay for a staff member and travel and materials and allow us to do things like community outreach, talking to individual community organizations, going to different parts of the state, learning from industries who could benefit from public banking and begin to deeply understand what the needs are. Um, and that can help shape our future efforts and make this legislation um, an effort more, more relevant um, to everyone in the state. Uh, we would love to explore other applications that public banking could support, um, like cannabis and farming and public broadband, and there's probably many more ideas that you have. We would love to network with others around the country and the world. Um, we had a conversation with the Massachusetts public banking group, who's done a lot of work and research and has a great bill that they're pushing this year. Um, there are a lot of groups to learn from that can help us not reinvent the wheel and um, give us their great ideas for not just the policy, but also um, just the, the mobilization of, of people. Um, and we wanna build better partnerships with our elected leaders um, and also to support all of you, our network and provide the resources needed to reach out to your individual legislators and be able to talk about why we need public banking. So there's just a few of the things that we are um, hoping to be able to do a lot more of uh, this coming year and beyond. And we're so happy that all of you joined. Um, hopefully this was informative. Hopefully you learned something. Hopefully you got excited about public banking. Um, we really think this is a great solution for investing in community. There's so much investments that need to be made here. Um, and this is one tool that will allow us to do that. All right, I think that wraps up our presentation. Um, 
we have plenty of time for questions if anybody has them. Um, yeah, I see some people are answering in the chat. We are recording this and we can share it out. Um, what is the resistance to public banking in Washington? Does anyone wanna take that? And I'll preface this by saying we are, a lot of us are you know, just starting to jump into this work. So if we can't answer your questions, we can get back to you or we can find out, um, but we'll try our best in this meeting. I can try to answer this. And I think someone else from our board probably can contribute to uh, the main arguments we've heard about public banking is one um, uh, that um, essentially when it comes down to it, some private banks don't want the competition. Uh, if we do have a really robust public bank Marco, is he cutting out for uh, others? Or is move to the public sector, they want to be so reliant on public institutions. Kind of goes to, oh, am I cutting out? You're okay now. Okay. Um, this kind of goes to another question. Someone kind of talked about, you know, who are the main advocates? You kind of flip flip side. The Democrat who killed this bill in the committee, he has a history in working for Bank of America. Um, so some of the public, the private banks are opposed to this idea. Uh, the other arguments we've had is um, we just think some people are not aware of the, the benefits. They think that, you know, there's other opportunities to capital to find capital for projects and they don't necessarily need, see the need for public bank. But once we kind of illustrate to them is that it really broadens our horizon to what we can fund and it can get away from some of these practices that uh, are, are more cumbersome, especially for local governments then I think it's it's obvious that this is a really important option to have uh, on the table as a financing tool. Yeah, I'll jump in and say, um, you know, maybe it's not so much pro like hard resistance, but it's an idea that maybe a lot of people aren't that familiar with, or they're so used to the system now that it seems like it's, a little bit difficult to wrap their mind around a new a new system. Um, I think one win we had this year was that um, the Association of Washington Cities uh, testified in support of this bill. I know in the past they had not done that, and so I think that's one thing we can look more into is um, you know which cities do see that benefit and connect with them more and um, be able to you know understand that angle. Um, Ruth, I see you have your hand up. Uh, I would defer to, uh, I want to speak to that, but I'd defer to Chris Mason. Uh, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> so I was, uh, I noticed that my represent, one of my reps um, voted against it in committee. And <clears throat> I was, he's having a phone town hall shortly. And so I was thinking about asking him why he voted against it. Uh, we are very rural. Uh, this is Mason County. Um, so one of the most rural <clears> that has the smallest city or it only has one incorporated city in the whole county. Anyway, uh, I'm thinking about the fact that this uh, bank would be another tool in the toolbox that could be used for infrastructure, right? And I didn't notice that on your, on the one page or on the website, it just basically has housing and some other stuff. And so I was thinking about the having some talking points would be helpful uh, that the, the cities um, having testified that that would be a great one. I'm trying to think of like a really, you know, good sentence that basically says, why did you vote against this, even though it would do this kind of a thing. So I could use some help with that. And uh, shout out to Stoney, who's on the call. Thanks. Okay. Um, well, let me follow up with the first um, uh, issue of why uh, uh, people are against it. It's important to make a distinction between the big banks like Bank of America and the community and local banks and credit unions. There, we want to uh, partner with them, but the big banks want our business. Uh, and when I say our business, they want our tax money. They receive deposits. And we're talking about many billions of dollars here. 
And they are able to take public money and make loans on it, private loans, and then they reap um, the interest from those private loans. And it's even more, one of the reasons we want a public bank is because banks are able to use the Federal Reserve System to multiply the number of loans they are able to make based on one loan. So that multiplies both the amount of, say, infrastructure that you could build if we had that money accessible to a public bank, uh, it would be a very self-sustaining and growing bank, just like private banks are and do. And I think one thing that is important to realize is that public, the private banks are using public money for uh, private profit. On the uh, second issue, I'll just throw out that uh, Liz, the uh, woman who has a small family farm on Lumi Island, um, the farmers definitely need a lot of help because of climate change. It's going to hit them. We've had a drop, drought in, in uh, central um, eastern Washington, as you probably are aware of. And um, another thing regarding improving the climate situation, CO2 in the atmosphere, is there are new techniques emerging in agriculture that um, suggest we can put massive volumes of carbon in the soil. And that is a very exciting new area as carbon sequestration, and it's a win across the board. You get healthier plants, more productivity, and you are at the same time reducing the carbon in the atmosphere. So there are many kinds of infrastructure and uh, in agriculture, I think that is going to be a key component. Are you connected with the, the agricultural community? Chris? Oops, disappeared. Oh, no. No, no, I'm not. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a volunteer with Fairbrook Washington though, um, so that I'm, uh, so I'm just an interested person observing uh, local politics out here. And, and that is uh, one of the things that gets talked about a lot is how our representatives are bringing in funding for this project and that project. And, you know, they take credit for getting the, the Build Back Better money and, and bringing it to the local areas and, and things like that. Or, you know, advocating for their the the local projects at the in the legislature right that's just i mean that's the bread and butter message that they bring is how they are helping the local organizations and and municipalities get things done awesome um we love that you are ready to engage your senator um, i put it in the chat but if you want to it sounds like maybe Stoney already has your information, but if you want us to follow up on some of those talking points, we're happy to do so. Um, if you shoot one of us your email, uh, if we don't have it already. Um, there was another question on who are the strongest advocates. Uh, I'm gonna put a link to the bill in the chat. Um, you'll see the list of sponsors there. So again, the main sponsor is Patty Cooter. Um, but also in the committee hearing, uh, Liz Lovelett, who um, is the second sponsor, spoke as well very passionately. Um, I love some of the things she had to say. And there's you know, a significant list of progressive senators there who are supportive. So um, that should help you kind of see who has co-signed so far. Any other questions? I will say something else. <clears throat> Have you guys uh, heard of the Take Action Network, TAN, as a, a platform for advocacy? Um, I've heard of Action Network, where you can send emails to your legislators. No, no, this, this, is, this is a Washington-specific um, thing that was created by one of the Indivisible groups, and its, it's nickname is TAN, uh, T-A-N, and it has, it allows you to create an action that you want people to take on a specific bill. Um, it's actually a really great tool um, for doing for, for your own organizing as well as asking for people to, to, 
to do those sign in pro or, you know, uh, contact their legislators. So I think it's a, it would be great to get hooked in with that. Um, I will, I will send an email. I can do an invite, I think to, or also I can ask the guy who runs that, which, uh, yeah, about getting you guys hooked up. Wonderful. That was great. All right. Well, thank you to Olivia for joining us to speak um, to affordable housing, housing piece. Uh, we'd love to connect with more folks. We will be sending out a follow-up from this presentation with the action items, with the recording, and hope to stay connected with you. Have a great evening, everyone. Right.